First Timothy chapter three, and um, in recent years, I, I say recent years. You know, when I was a child, recent years was the last year and a half. Now, recent years is the last twenty years. And uh, but in recent years, uh, in the political scene in America. You hear statements like this. A person's personal life is nobody else's business and shouldn't be drug into the public arena. And you've heard statements like that. And, uh, of course, there's a reason they don't want that mentioned because uh, they don't want uh, exposed as to the wickedness and the sin and the evil that they're living. And so they carve out this nice-sounding platitude that, well, the personal man's personal life it's nobody else's business. What I do behind the doors of my house is nobody else's business. Dear friend, I'm going to tell you it's everybody's business. And you better understand, the Bible said no man liveth unto himself. And you do a lot of your living behind the doors of your house. In fact, you're no more than what you are behind the doors of your house. No man liveth unto himself. Your private life does affect other people's lives. In fact, I'd submit to you that your private life affects other people's lives more than your public life affects other people's lives. And saying that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, let's read verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and snare of the devil. We'll stop reading right there. Lord, help us to... Preach the Word of God tonight. Help us to feed the flock of God. And I pray the Holy Spirit will be in our midst in a very special way and convey the truths and the seriousness of the truths that the Lord we're reading here tonight. I pray, God, that you'll bless this service. We thank you for this time as we graze through the Word of God. Help us, Lord, to feed on the Word of God and desire it, Heavenly Father, the meat of the Word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, let's continue tonight and... Uh, and what I want to preach on tonight is just the text that were there uh, about, about being a preacher. About being a preacher. Qualifications of a preacher. If there's anything that will humble you, is preaching this while you're preaching. <laughs> anything that will uh, take you down a notch or two, it's trying to preach this text. And... Uh, I just want to take it word by word and look what it says. This is a true saying, chapter 3, if a man desire the office. That does away with women preachers. And I don't mean to be uh, mean or honorary about that, but that's just a fact. And um, it's a sign of spiritual uh, decline, spiritual deterioration when women have taken over. In fact, Isaiah chapter 3 teaches us that one of the signs of a nation when it's in spiritual decline is that Children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. And we're seeing that in this nation. And that's one reason I preach about manhood so much and the leadership of men in our country is because right now we're seeing the reap As men have declined and deteriorated in spiritual leadership, women begin to fill the vacuum. And uh, as that, as that uh, increases, then it becomes more and more the younger, men, the younger boys begin to think this is women's stuff going to church. And all across this country, you've seen this deterioration. And that doesn't make women inferior, but you can't change that Bible. You try to, you're in trouble with Almighty God. Amen. Instead of a man. Then another thing, if you notice that husband and one wife, pretty hard to be a woman and be the husband and one wife. I appreciate some of you men saying amen right there. Amen. It wouldn't hurt you women. The husband of one wife. All right, now I said a man. So anyway, desire, and I want to let you know that word desire. That might seem strange to some of you, but that's part of grace. God, when God's grace, when God's going to call somebody to the ministry, to, especially into I hear what we call bishop or a pastor or shepherd of, the, of a local flock, God's going to put a desire inside of him. And so if you say, Reggie, I might 
I may be called to preach. I'm not sure. I will tell you this. If you get to where you can't help it, God's called you. God, by His grace, will give you the desire to do that which you thought you would never do. And that's kind of hard to explain. All I can tell you is that God put that desire in me to do what I felt like He was calling me to do. But uh, that desire is not a pumped-up desire, not a self-desire. It's not a man-made desire. It's a desire that comes from God. You know, God is when God's grace comes upon you for salvation, He gives you the desire to repent, the power to repent. He gives you the desire to serve the Lord, the power to serve the Lord. It's the same way in the call to preach. He'll give you the desire to do it and give you the power to do it. So, what's that word desire? And by the way, there's nothing wrong with desiring to serve the Lord. We ought to want to serve the Lord. He said, desire the office, and that is one of the offices of the church as bishop. And again, a bishop is an overseer of the flock of God. That's That's what it means. It's an overseer of the flock of God. He desireth a good work. You ought to not waste your time. The Bible said, for as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And I'll tell you, when you serve the Lord, you've not wasted your life. I've done a lot of things that probably was a waste of my time, but serving God's not one of them. And I'll never have to turn around the closing days of my life and say, I wished I'd have never served God. I'll never have to say that. There may be things I may say I wished I'd never done, but this is not one of them. And he said he desire a good work. All right, then he begins to list things. He said, a bishop must then be blameless. I want to call your attention that he did not say sinless. And if he had said sinless, nobody could be one. But he said blameless. Uh, that means that you're without fault in the situation. That if you're accused, you're not guilty. Uh, blameless. Uh, in other words, don't go be doing around all things that's your fault. Creating situations and circumstances and all that put you at blame. Uh, you'll never do any good if everybody's, uh, if, if blame can honestly be laid upon you for a lot of different situations. Now, uh, he said, then the husband of one wife. Now, there's a lot of debate on this, and I won't argue with you about it. I won't waste three minutes about it, but I'm going to preach at you about it. If you want to argue, go out there to one of them trees and argue with it. But uh, there's been a lot of ideas. Uh, some use it as the polygamy idea. Well, yes, just one wife at a time. Well, I don't think that one swims too well across the creek. Uh, some say one, uh, some said one wife at a time. But historically, the church has always taken this that uh, the man's to be married to one wife and not have a second living wife. Amen. That's the historical biblical position that is not to have another wife living. Now, I'll tell you something. I know some rough situations. I know some preachers, good men of God, whose wives left them. Divorce them. That makes it rough. But for Christ's sake, and I'm just going to be honest with you, and it, and if it, it, it was to ever happen, you, you'll see it happen. If my wife was to leave me and divorce me, and I had done everything I could to keep the marriage together, I'd come behind this pulpit and say, you need to find you another pastor because I can't do it at this point. Because if I can't rule my own, if I can't lead spiritually well enough, you know what? I know some good men. I don't know all about their home life, and I'm not here to judge them. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own master he standeth or falleth but i'm telling you this that the idea behind all this is that god when he on a flock he wants an example the bible says in first peter chapter 5 be an example to the flock the example is this you have christ and yet the church it's a pit marriage is a picture of that jesus never divorces his spouse Amen. and i'm telling you this that that uh, listen he, he said all that thou hast given me i've kept and this picture of a marriage together is a picture of Christ in the church. And God wants that which is leading the church spiritually to be an example and a picture of Christ in the church. Besides that, if I get involved in a divorce situation, and I do not, I will have to start twisting the Scriptures and justifying and coming out with human rationalizing and human reasoning as to why I'm still in the pulpit. And the next thing you know, I've perverted it. The next thing, I've opened the gate for all kinds of rationalization and human reasoning to violate the Word of God. Now, this is the crux of it. The practical application is this, that God wants every young person growing up in that church to see that God can make a marriage work and to see the picture of Christ in the church. And that's what He wants. And whenever that doesn't happen, it distorts the whole picture of Christ in the church and the purity and the rightness of it. And so he says, the husband of one wife. 
And again, I don't want to get into a lot of deals. You can believe what you want to about it. And I, I've had preachers call me on this and say, well, you don't, you read, you, you know, there's a lot of bad situations out there, but I'm going to stand on the Word of God. That's what it says, the husband of one wife. Now, the next thing it says that a pastor must be is vigilant. Vigilant. The Bible says in another place in 1 Peter 5, chapter 5 and verse 7, be vigilant, be sober. For your adversary, the devil, goeth about as a roaring lion, seeking him he may devour. Now, where's what the deal is? Now, listen to me. Some of you boys, God call you to preach, and you go pastor church, you listen to this one good. <clears throat> when you get to this list right here, God is saying that a preacher cannot be somebody who's dilly-dallying around when he has the care of souls in front of him, and he better be watching, he better be alert, he better be on the ball and keep his eye on the ball, and he better know what's going on in people's lives. He said, for they watch for your souls. Obey them. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. As they that must give account. You know what God's saying here? God is saying, Reggie, you're going to give an account how you were vigilant to watch for the souls of the people of that church. That means that if I see your child going off the deep end in rebellion, it'd be wise for me to talk to the father of that family and say, listen, I'm concerned. It means that I ought to be, if I see somebody having spiritual warfare, and I mean, Satan's after them, and Satan's all over them, that I ought to go into special prayer that week for you. That I ought to spend time before the throne of God interceding for you. I ought to be watchful and vigilant because Satan is going about as a roaring lion, trying to tear every marriage up and every home up and every individual and every fellowship up, every friend up. And God says, hey, if you're going to be a preacher... You can't drop the ball. You stay on the ball. You keep vigilant. You watch what's going on. You can't, you know, I, hey, now, I'm not against fishing. I'm not against golf. I think you've got to work for pleasure. I think, <laughs> But let me tell you something. The idea is this, and I'm not saying if you do that that you can't be vigilant. But listen, God said if you're going to pastor a church, you're going to be on the ball. Listen, fathers need to be on the ball. Mothers need to be on the ball. They need to be vigilant. What's going on in the lives of those people that are under my jurisdiction and under my care? And so, if you're going to be a pastor, uh, you need to be on the stick. You can't just be dealing down around and just saying, well, that's all right. No problem there. You better get to praying. You better get to working through authority. And that's why you need to preach the Word of God. Preach the Word of God. That Word has power in helping people. The next thing is sober. He said, uh, be sober. Being sober is the opposite of being silly, goofy. Um, not serious. Let me tell you something. It's a sobering bit thing when I think that every little child born in this church house is going to grow up. If they grow up under my preaching, they're either going to go to heaven or hell. That, that ought to sober you up. It ought to sober me up to know that I'm going to give an account to God for how I, pre- how I pastor this church. And I'm going to give an account to God about feeding the clock. That's serious business. Now, let me tell you a little something. This week I stood in a federal courtroom where a young man was sentenced to the federal penitentiary. And that judge called him up there, and he stood before that judge. Let me tell you something. It, fun, the funny time was over. That's Everybody ought to go. You ought to just take a day and go to a federal hearing when somebody's being sentenced to a state. Not state. Federal pen. And I heard that attorney tell the family in the hallway afterward, pray that he doesn't go to Illinois. Pray that he doesn't go to Oklahoma. They're mean prisons. And it's serious business. Now, I want to tell you why. And I, it's amazing to me how God dovetails messages and stuff. Because I baptized that boy when he was small. And I left that courtroom wondering where I'd gone wrong. Made me think, maybe I should have went and seen him a couple, three, four years ago. And said to that young man, you're on the wrong path. And I listened to that judge, and here's an interesting thing. You know what that judge said? He said, young man, you're, by your own admission of guilt in this court, have put yourself under the jurisdictional sentencing guidelines of the federal statutes. And I have no choice but to sentence you at, to, to at least the federal guidelines. And the 18 months was the minimum. of federal. He said, I don't have a choice to let you walk out of here. You're going to the federal penitentiary. And I want to say to you young people in this church tonight, you, may, you know, I've had 
I've had young people tell me they hated my guts when they were young people in this church because of things I preached. But I want you to know something, that you cannot say honestly, I don't love you, and I don't want your best. And I thought to myself, I was sitting there in that back seat, and I thought, this is nothing compared to judgment at God's judgment bar. This is nothing. As terrible as this is to hear that boy sentenced to 18 months in the federal penitentiary, this is nothing compared to standing before the... And I, and, and, uh, I thought of that verse. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. And I want to tell you, everybody here tonight, including myself, you are going to stand before the judge of this universe. Amen. And brother, I tell you, I told Donnie, we were talking on the phone. I said, Donnie, I cannot imagine what it would be like to hear God Almighty say, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I cannot imagine what it would be like to hear God tell angels to grab hold of you and cast you into the lake of fire forever and ever. That is sober business. That's why it's not, people, you know, I tell a few jokes. I read a few funnies. Mary Hart does good like a medicine. But beyond that, folks, it is a serious business with your families. And if you're going to be a pastor, you don't play games with people's souls. And the one thing I do not want to be accused of at the judgment bar of God is having a fear of man and afraid to tell you the truth, even though I knew you didn't like it. I've got a situation in my life right now where because... I love them enough to tell them the truth. They've totally cut me off and hurt me every way they know how to hurt me. But I'd rather be there than having caved in and piddled around and act like it's okay. And when the great day of judgment comes, have them look at me and say, Why on earth didn't you stand upon the truth of God's Word? I'm being judged by it now. Sober business. God said eternity is not silly, funny business, is it? The next thing of good behavior, that's where I fail, (laughs) of good behavior. Uh, You know, someone has said, have a good walk, not just a good talk. In other words, it says, preach or practice what you're preaching. Don't go out and behave in ways that you're telling other people not to behave in. Of good behavior. I don't think that's God asking too much of us, do you? I don't think God's asking too much of a preacher to behave well, to... uh, to mind his business and take care of things and behave well. And uh, then the next one, given to hospitality. Now, you boys that may preach, I'm going to tell you something about this. You better get a wife that is, has a very meek and yielded and sweet and wonderful spirit because when you invite people over and you didn't tell her, you're going to find out what kind of woman she is. And I will tell you, now, I'm, I'm probably weak in this good behavior area, but I'm strong in this giving to hospitality. <laughs> If I don't have to cook it, it's no problem. Hey, come on over for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> you cook it. You cook all the food, okay? You know. No, Karen's been great about that. I bless her heart. I know it's been times when maybe, you know, I could, I could see the shock, but you know, she's never, not one time has she ever got in the truck or the car after church and said, what do you think you're doing inviting those people over? Don't you know this and don't you? Never. Ever like that, you know? Just say, you know what? That's, you know, she just, she just, you know, just goes. And does it. And Karen, I want to thank you publicly for for being like that. Because if she got in the car and griped and whined and cut a fit and spell, you know, I'd get to where I don't, well, better not invite anybody over. Wife get mad. You know, and and I know sometimes maybe it wasn't easy for her, but fellas, if you're going to be given the hospitality, you might want to remember that side of it. But giving the hospitality means more than that. It means that you enjoy and love people. You know something I do enjoy and love people. I don't like some of the ways they act and some of the things they do, but I love people. Can I give you a little something? If you're going to serve the Lord in the ministry, you're going to have to love people. You're going to have to like people, enjoy people. I mean to tell you what, uh, I've had people kidding me. You know, I've done a lot of auctions over the years, and people, and, and people come in and say, well, you know, they kind of get the idea, well, you're just putting on the dog because you've got this sale to do. Or you just, no, no, you just got to like people. It's easy if you like people. It's not hard. You gotta make up your mind you love people. God created that person. They have value. They can be a blessing to your life. I mean, my, my life is enriched by people. Uh, that's why you wanna let God give you all the children 
that he'll give you. I mean, where would my life be without Suzanne? What if me and Karen had said, oh, oh, Lord God, that's over, it's over. Where would I be if we had Nathan and said, that's it? I would never know Zach, never known Ben, never known Hannah, never known Sarah, never known Suzanne. You've got to love people. You've got to love people. Life's not about you. And I'm telling you something. If you're going to be in the ministry, part of dying to yourself is just loving people. And I don't know. Uh, now, do I like to be alone by myself? You bet. And I, and, I, and I have my times alone. And I need that time alone. But I'm telling you something. I like people. And it, I didn't try to jive it up. I, you know, but I believe this. If God calls you to the ministry, I believe He'll give you a divine love for people. I believe He'll make you to where you enjoy people and love people. And you're going to have to be given to hospitality. And by the way, you need to be a little friendly. It won't hurt you to stick out. I mean, you're going to be, have any kind of blessing of the hand of God. The Bible said, you know, he that will have friends must show himself friendly. Jesus was a friend of sinners. I believe Jesus waved at him, said, how you doing? Good to see you today. I believe Jesus stuck out his hand. And I believe tonight that if we're going to serve the Lord in any capacity, we're going to have to be friendly people. Remember I preached on that message here a couple weeks ago on the... Uh, or was it here? I can't even remember where I preached what. But, uh, you, know, you know, if you're going to show yourself friendly, a church ought to be a friendly church. It may, they, they may accuse us of everything in the world, but they at least ought to be able to say, you know what? Them people shake the arm off your shoulder when you go to that church house. Be a friendly church. Amen. Smile. Be given to hospitality. I mean, that's why I said, I'm going to invite all these young people over. You know, there may not be enough room to park. There may not be. The bathrooms may be stopped up when they I don't know. I'll have been to bring some porta potties. I don't know. But I'm just saying, listen, you can't worry about it. You just probably got to be given hospitality. You can't worry about what people do. You just got to love them for Christ's sake. Now, the next one is sober, but good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 11, the Bible gives the gifts, of, you know, and the, and to, talks about some of the gifts given. And there's the only one dual gift I know of. It says pastors and teachers. And I believe this all my heart. When God calls a man to pastor, he's going to call him to teach the Word of God. Amen. And this is so critical. There can be many things that you might be failing at and whatever that. You may not be good at hospitality and all this, that, and the other. But I'm going to tell you something. If you don't feed that flock, you're in trouble. Because you're to feed the flock of God. A pastor ought to teach the Word of God. Go to First Peter chapter 5. Just flip over a few pages after James over there. 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse number 1. I'd like for everybody to look at that. I'm talking about, and you know what's really funny tonight? There's probably some young man sitting in this church house. The last thing he thinks he will ever do is pastor a church. And 20 years from now, you'll think about this message. I'm telling you, the whole time I grew up, the whole time I grew up, until I was 18 years old, it never crossed my mind. That's the stupidest thing you ever heard tell of. If I, I went to school right over here, sitting in classrooms, in boring, dull classrooms. And do you think that in the slightest imagination, and this was a patch of trees over here, do you think in my wildest imagination I ever thought I'd be over here Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, pastoring a flock of people over here on this hillside? Growing up and going to school. Did you ever think when I rode that bus or rode, drove, come home from, or come up from milking to that, do you think I ever dreamed that I'd be pastoring a church? No, didn't have no idea, didn't want to, didn't plan on it. So it would be funny to me 20 years from now if I'm alive, hear somebody come out and say, you know, I was there that night you preached that, and that was the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing. Well, anyway, verse number 1, 1 Peter chapter 5, The elders which are among you, I exhort him also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Here it is, verse number 2, Feed the flock of God. Now, we'll be our lake and say, that didn't say beat them, it said feed them. Now, you beat, every time you call the sheep to the, to the feed trough, and you beat them, they're going to quit coming to the trough after a while. Now, you can preach hard. Uh, Bridget, she's not in here right now, so I can preach on Bridget. Uh, Bridget told one of my daughters something one time. Bridget, you're back there somewhere. You know, don't say anything. I'll find it out, and then I'll tell it in the pulpit. She said something to this nature. She said, you know, somebody else gets up and preaches something rough and mean. She said, I, have it. I, I may not get it right, Bridget, but I'll try to get it better. I try to, and she said, might have a tendency to reject it. But she said, Uncle Reggie preaches something mean and rough. She said, I'm able to receive it because I know he loves me. Now listen to me. People will receive tough, rough preaching as long as they know you love them and you're not trying to, you don't have some agenda. You're preaching for the glory of God and you love them. 
And preaching needs to get rough once in a while. There needs to be reproof and there needs to be rebuke and so forth. But he said, feed the flock of God. Now, I want to say something to you. Fellas, if you pastor a church, you're to do the work of an evangelist. That means you're to win people to Jesus Christ, but you can't get up every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and preach an evangelistic message. Every time. You can't preach a revival gospel. I mean, you know, they need to be told. You need to get the gospel in there. I don't disagree with that, but I'm going to tell you, this book it covers every subject you can ever think about and imagine. And people need to grow. After they're saved, they need to grow in the Lord, and you have to feed the flock of God. A lot of people are saved, and they don't grow. Amen. And you've got to feed the flock of God. But at the same time, do the work of the evangelist. People. It says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Watch verse 3. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. That's critical. But being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. God's given you that there. Now, a call to preach is a call to constant, continual study the rest of your life. Never done studying. Never done studying. You're never done studying. You're never done studying. And you know what's good? God will give you grace. I don't want to be done studying. I don't, I haven't, I ain't, I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm learning, 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 always learning. Always. I'm going to tell you a little something happened this morning. This was, I told Karen about it this afternoon. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't think I'd tell you all this, but I'm going to admit my stupidity and admit how much I need the Lord. I had been really thinking about preaching on the subject of child discipline, child training stuff for three, four, five weeks. I thought, you know, I need to preach on that. I said I do that every year. And whenever Susanna brought in that little doggy deal, you know, that was like confirmation from heaven that I'm supposed to preach on uh, that. And so I'm working on that, and I still felt like, you know, man, I need to keep preaching through First Timothy, but I'm just going to have to lay First Timothy aside and preach on the raising of children. I worked this week on getting that message together, had it all together, almost ready to come to church, and it's like going, ding, 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 ding. And I said, yes, Lord. He said, if you'll just read First Timothy chapter 3, your text is there, and I'm going to show you a deeper level of child, why you need child correction, child training, and child discipline, because... It affects the spiritual leadership of, of the church. And God gave me that about 15 minutes before I left for church this morning. Here I had that. You know what I'm saying? Listen, folks, it's not intellectualism. It's being in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. God really had me at the text already. You tell me a greater text where it says in verse number 5, For if a man not know how to rule his own house, how should he take care of the church of God? You show me a better text for preaching on child training than that. Now, and here I was thinking I was having to leave First Timothy. What? God said, you don't have to leave First Timothy. You're there, dodo. You know? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> now let me take, give you a little something. Restaurants that serve good food, clean food, are full. And churches that preach good food Clean food are full. I'm telling you something. People will come if you'll preach the Word. You don't have to be a theological whammo. You just get up there and preach that Bible verse by verse, line by line, precept upon precept. Get your heart and soul into it. I'm telling you what, God will bless it. And I don't, I'm telling you, He will. Now, uh, anyway, let, turn, go, now let me show you in this deal about, He said, after teach. Go to, go to Luke chapter 11. I will show you my, my verse for the ministry. God several years ago gave me this text for me in the ministry. Now, I appreciated what the, Brother Travis said. What he's telling you is the truth. And it's good for you men to have to get a message together because it does make... If I had to go what you do, if I had to go milk his cows for one milking, I'd come back and say, Boy, Travis, I don't know how you do it. Now, I've milked a lot of cows, but I won't tell you what if I went down... But I'm saying this to you that you never know what somebody else is doing. But now here's how, here's how I get messages. Here's how the ministry works for me. And it's a sweet, 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 wonderful thing. Here's Luke 11, chapter 5, verse number 5. Everybody there say amen. amen. Verse number 5. And he said, unto, here's a parable. He said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, look at capital F. Lend, friend, lend me three loaves. Watch verse 6. For a friend of mine is in his journey, has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. 
And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. And I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his, his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And the next couple of verses talks about asking, uh, seeking, and knocking, and getting it. Now you say, Reggie, what do you, what do you mean that's the ministry verse for you for your life? Here it is. Look at verse number 6. A friend of mine is in his journey. Every week of my life, when I'm preparing messages, it's like this. I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I've got a bunch of friends coming up here Sunday. And they're on a long journey. They're headed from here to eternity. And God, look what it said, verse 6. They're going to come to church there Sunday morning, Lord, and I have nothing to set before them. And that's the truth. I have nothing. Now, I could feed you series of robot catalogs and NIVs and RSVs and every other kind of alphabet soup, and you'd get nothing. I could give you man's intellectualism and philosophies, and I could talk high and lofty, but you would not get what you need for your spirit. It might fascinate your soul, and you'd go, oh, that was an awesome message. Don't ever say that to me. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> oh, mercy. But I have nothing. That's the truth. Did you know where you know where I get the food at? From my friend. Now, look at the word midnight. If you ever pastor a church or preach, you'll get this. God will let you get to bed, get real comfortable, and then the Holy Spirit will speak to you about a passage of Scripture that He wants the flock to get. And if you go... Yeah, Lord, that's really good. I'll get it in the morning. It is gone. And there just will not be, even if you think of it mind-wise, it won't be there like it would be. If you get up, go into your study, drop on your knees and say, Oh, God, illuminate my mind and show me what you're wanting to do here and start writing and studying and looking up the Scriptures. And, and you may just get a little bit, but if you'll get it down, then God will build on that all during the week and God will bring circumstance situations into that thing. Now, he said, right at midnight, and friend, lend me how many loaves? Three, Three loaves. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Oh. Mm-hmm. Amen. I have nothing. Did you know Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Now, I have a friend. His name is Jesus. He lends me three loaves every week. But I have to... You know what importunity means? It means... Continual begging, continual asking, continual seeking, and not giving up when they say no. Did you know what God will find out? God will find out how bad I want something from heaven. It's not that He couldn't drop it and give it to me right then, but I'm going to tell you, God has a purpose in withholding that, that anointing. He has a purpose in withholding that, that, that Scripture from you, or whatever it may be, because He wants you to draw close to Him. And make you realize, I cannot do this in my own strength. I must have the Lord. I don't have anything. Lord, Jesus, give us this day our daily bread. We need the bread from heaven. Jesus is that bread. And like I say, the importunity means it means nonstop asking. God never wants me to get to the place where I think I got it. God never wants me to get preaching 28 years and say, well, I don't need to pray now. I don't need to study. I've got all these messages File the way over here. I've probably got seven, eight hundred thousand messages. I don't know how many I got. I mean, it's full of them. I feel sorry for the guy that tries to read my notes. Amen. But I'm saying this to you. God does not want me to get dependent upon that and say, I don't need to pray and seek His face anymore. God always wants to keep me before the throne with, by the way, most of us like fresh bread. Most of us don't want stale leftover junk. All right? Anyway, but you know what the good part about it is? He said, he will arise and give him as many as he needed. So listen, if God calls you to preach, he's going to call you to teach. And I believe this with all my heart. People need to be taught the Word of God. There are just things people need to be taught. A lot of people don't obey and don't do what the will of the Lord is because they don't know what the will of the Lord is. And let me say something here right now. I thank God for the call to preach because I'll tell you something. I would never have studied the Bible. And never have had the joy of, uh, that I have if I hadn't felt the compulsion to have something to feed the flock with. It is a blessing to be called to teach and to preach the Word of God. It is a special, special thing. 
And so I just want to get, let's go on to the next one. Uh, number, verse number three, not giving wine. Uh, folks, I want to tell you something. I am not giving myself to that which destroys people's lives. I am not giving myself to wine or any other type of liquor. First Timothy chapter three, we're back over there. I'm not giving myself to that in any kinds of amounts. I don't believe in sipping. And I don't believe in dipping. <laughs> Liquor's out of hell. Preacher ought not drink. People ought, people ought not drink. Amen. Amen. Now, I believe you ought to be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, whereas in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Amen. God commands us, be filled with the Spirit of God. And I'll tell you, preacher, if anybody in the world needs to be filled with the Spirit of God, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know how you can preach. I don't know how you could pastor a church without being filled with the Spirit of God. I don't know how anybody could. And I'm telling you what, let me say something to you. Being filled with the Spirit is just simply yielding. I guarantee you, God will fill you if you yield. All right? Now, next one, no striker. I mean, you ain't supposed to hit nobody. What quiet in here? Preacher ain't going. To, and preacher ain't supposed to go around. To, what was no? It wasn't no Sam Jones. It was old Cartwright, Peter Cartwright, old Methodist circuit riding preacher. Met that old boy on a horse on a trail. The old boy started cussing him. I mean, railing on him. No, Peter let him get right up there. Just he nudged his horse right up from beside him. He cold cocked him, knocked him straight off that horse. Peter Cartwright jumped down on top of him, straddle legged and got his hands on his head, and he said, "I ain't letting you up till you get saved." <laughs> Peter Cartwright said, "The old boy got saved. He finally <laughs> let him up." <laughs> now, that's a strange way to meet with a man to Christ, but I'm gonna tell you something. Hey, Christian people, we need to get away from this. I'll knock your block off stuff. That's stupid. I'm going to whoop you stuff. That's stupid. Now, I did not say you don't defend your family. So don't go around whooping people. Act like you're going to whoop people. You know, I had a bad deal happen here a few years ago over at Cell Barn. Old boy brought his big old dog in there. and He had been asked before. And as in, anyway, why I'd ask him to leave. And he smarted off and cussed and done everything else. And. I went over to him and I said, now listen, I'm asking you one more time. I'm going to call the police if you don't do something. And, uh, and he, he let me have it again. Well, I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you won't take him out, I'll take the dog out for you. And when I started to grab the leash of that dog, take him outside, he grabbed my arm. He was sitting on this deal, grabbed my arm and pulled me down. When he pulled me down, I hit my head against the back of the seat and just busted my eye wide. I mean, blood just squirted everywhere. And like the old timers, you say, he got my blood up. I come out of there fighting. Now, I did not strike him. I took him down by didn't strike him. But the best thing I could have done is just let the authorities handle it. Been a lot better off. Hmm. Yeah. He said, I didn't think preachers got mad. Well, Paul said, who is offended and I burn not. Mm hmm. Yep. No striker. That means not quick-tempered, too. No outburst of hand. Do you know what the old preachers used to say? No outburst of hand or tongue. You can strike people in other ways besides your hand. You can strike them with your tongue. Nonviolent. Jesus went as a lamb to the slaughter. He could have called 10,000 angels, folks. But he went to the cross. I want to encourage you young boys. I know your blood gets to rising and you're, you know, you're getting better teenage years. And all of a sudden you look down there one day and you go, wow, wow, we, man, alive. <laughs> and then a few years later you're going to go be a good land of living. <laughs> it moves from here. The bones move from here to here. <laughs> God's people ought not be violent people, but they should be strong people. They should defend the fatherless and the weak. I don't believe a godly Christian man ought to stand by while somebody's raping a woman. I believe you ought to step right in the middle of that and knock his teeth down his throat and kick him sideways and make him think that the devil's chewing him up. 
Yes, sir. I don't think you ought to idly stand by and watch somebody be robbed and mistreated or a child mistreated. I don't think it's right. For, I think that's weakness and cowardice. That's not godliness. But you should never start a fight. You might have to finish one once in a while, but don't ever start one. Okay? The next one, not greedy of filthy lucre. Now, this is important. First of all, not greedy. You ever heard the word lucrative? God does not, listen to me, God does not necessarily say here that something that's lucrative is wrong. What he says is don't be greedy of filthy lucre. What he's saying is they're un, unjust, ungodly gain. The Bible condemns that under no circumstance. Now, how do preachers be guilty of filthy lucre? Well, let me tell you how the Roman Catholic Church has done it for 18, 1900 years. Praying your loved ones out of purgatory. That's filthy lucre. Let me tell you how the Protestants do it. We have this new book. Every family needs one. You don't have this yet? Oh, for a, this three week offer. $165 is four cassette deal. It only costs us 75 cents to make it. We're giving it to you for the low price of $135. Get on the phone. God's telling you right now to get you on the phone. Get your credit card out. God's telling That's filthy, stupid, greedy looker. If you can't, if you ain't got any better sense than that, they ought to sue your brain for non-support. Oh, here's another one. Here's our little bag of salt. We'll send this to you for eighty-five dollars, and it'll and and God will bless you. And it's amazing the Protestant Bible-believing American people are so duped by these scoundrels out here on filthy lucre, selling their little CDs and their cassettes and their movies and their books and their little pamphlets for unheard-of profits. Oh, now I know it's all going to a good cause, and then they'll get the little starving children. See this little boy. Don't be so stupid. Those guys will use anything and everything to pull the money out of your pocket. If you don't know that, you better get to learning that. Now, let me say this something in case any of you are called in the ministry. This is a tough one. In the Old Testament, the Levites had no inheritance in the land. God does not promise preachers much in this world. Now the next one we're going to skip over. <laughs> In the best manuscripts, it's not there. <laughs> oh, don't you like to read that joke? In the Greek, it's not there at all. <laughs> Patient. Mm. I don't know what to say about that one. The only thing I'll say this to you, that I think God increases our patience as the years go by. A man came up to me recently, and he was just really frustrated with some other folks who he just felt like ought to be. You know, we want instant spirituality in America. Now, you know, drive by. We want instant potatoes and instant everything. We want instant spirituality. And you know what? Isn't it amazing? And this man was, I mean, he really was kind of coming at me about the spiritual immaturity of some folks. And I happen to know that he didn't get saved until he was an adult. And I happen to think that at that particular time he was acting pretty spiritually immature. But the best thing I could tell him was this. How long has God been working on you? How long did it take God to get you where you're at today? Be patient with those people. In all honesty, if we would just learn to be patient with people, our lives would be so enriched. Because we're not patient with people, we cut them off. Or we, we act toward them in ways that cuts them off. And we never experience the fellowship and the joy of what they could be in Christ to our lives. I would encourage you. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.4, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be patient toward a few people that he likes. Toward all men. Patient toward all men. Patient. 
Remember God's, you know, the best way to do it, best way in the world to do it, is remember how patient God has been with you. If you remember how patient God is with you, you won't have too much trouble being patient with other people. Next thing is not a brawler. Now, a brawler, believe this or not, I don't know how many of you ever noticed, but did you know that when in, in the English language, in this, in this old authorized version language, did you know what brawl, if you went to a brawl back in the 1600s was? You went to a dance. And it was at dances where they got drunk and got into fights, and so it became known as, my cufflink is hung in my tablet. <laughs> I'm in a brawl. I'm in a brawl with my... Beat that thing. No, uh, uh, brawl <laughs> was an old English word for a rowdy dance. And so they go to this dance and they get drunk and the first thing you know, a fight would break out. And the next thing you know, brawl became a word for having a big knockdown drag out. And uh, it has to do with quarrelsome, being noisy and loud, talking about unimportant things that don't mount to a hill of beans and having a fight over nothing. And anyway, that's kind of it. Now, the next thing is not covetous. Not covetous. goes back to filthy lucre. They're all tied together. But covetousness is the base of the commandments that will wreck and ruin lives. If you do a study on what covetousness did to people's lives in the Bible, it will just shock you from Genesis to Revelation what covetousness, how it ruins people's lives. And that God says you can't be covetous and effective in the ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Flip over there just a couple of pages. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to Godliness, verse number 4, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, where cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, and corrupt minds, <clears throat> destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. And I'd like to hear some of these TV preachers preach this verse. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. Certainly we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us, there with be, let us be there with content. Verse number 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and the snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. God says you flee covetousness. And uh, it won't work. Well, when the, verse, the next part there, the next verse, we talked about ruling our house, preached on that this morning, uh, governing your own home and family. Verse number six, not a novice. A novice is a new beginner. One of the worst mistakes I ever made as a young preacher was I had a boy got saved. About two weeks later, he announced he'd been called to preach, and I had him preach. Ruined him. You know why it ruined him? Number one, he was kind of a good-looking boy, and the girls were already swooning about him. Number two, it lifted him up with pride. He just got saved. I mean, this guy, he didn't have any spiritual background at all. He was, just got saved. I let him get up and preach, and all the girls and the other boys sitting out there thinking, oh, this, it wouldn't make any difference if he just had Adam, Adam had a house cat named Sue. It, it, it wouldn't make any difference what he preached, you know. They, you know and, and you know what? It, it, it ruined him so fast. He got lifted up with pride, and boom. Uh, it wasn't even just a few weeks. He wasn't even walking with the Lord. Now, the worst thing you can do it said, not a novice. And so God says, don't put a novice. Don't put a new beginner. You let somebody be proven. You let somebody have a, you know, you make sure they've been down the trail a while. Amen? Get them down the trail a while. Uh, being lifted up with pride, he fallen in the condemnation of the devil. Uh, worst thing in the world, get a preacher. You know, that's why it's dangerous to tell preachers, oh, that message did me so much good. You watch that. You know, let, let God deal with him. You know, just don't, don't. Watch preachers can get so full of pride it's not even funny. They think, you know, what did the world do before I got here? And just stupid stuff like that, and, and it's easy, so be careful about that. But especially, you know, if you're not a novice, pretty soon you've been knocked down enough to, well, I'm not getting up very high. Because, but a novice doesn't have, you know, they're not aware of that spiritual warfare, and that's why it brings in the condemnation of the devil. The devil could move right in on that person. And, of course, when they get pride, what happens? God's over. God condemns pride and judges it almost instantly, and the guy's in trouble. So you don't do that to a person. You don't put somebody in charge of a Sunday school class or Bible class that is not seasoned in the Lord. All right. Verse number uh, 7, and, and we'll try to finish up here. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Who are those people that are without? The lost people. Lost people. Now, what's that mean? 
this goes back to, we've made the circle now, blameless. He must have a good report. You cannot, I cannot have an effective ministry if I'm going out here among lost people and cheating them and lying to them and living in such a way that reproaches the name of Jesus Christ. It will not work. A lost man may not come to the church where he's pastoring, but he ought not be able to honestly say, that man crooked me. He must have a good report of them which are out. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you something funny about lost people. Let me tell you who will run you down and lie on you and do everything in the world is stupid, and that's the religious crowd. But this old lost beer joint boy, you know what he'll say? Well, I don't care much for preachers, but I'll tell you one thing about him. If he tells you something, it'll be that way. That's how they are. They got more sense, they got more honest judgment about a guy, you know, the religious crowd, they get it in for you and they carve out all kinds of stuff, see? But I'm a little off, but you make sure if you're going to preach that those without have a good report and say, you know what? The guy tries to live by what he preaches. And so that's what God wants us to do. The lost should not be able to give an honest evil report against you. You can't stop all the mudslinging, the allegations, the accusations. Just make sure they're not true. I will close with this tonight. It's interesting what is not said. What is not said in the qualifications for a preacher? Nowhere in this passage, now listen to me real good, and don't, mis- don't mistake what I'm saying. Nowhere in this passage did it say he needs a Bible college degree. I'm not against Bible college degrees, unless they run you, and I'm against them. But you didn't interesting that God did not say he needs a theological Bible, nor does it say he needs a degree from the sem- seminary. Isn't that interesting? Now, chapter 2, verse 24 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A call to preach is a call to study the rest of your life. But isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit does not emphasize what we emphasize? The Holy Spirit doesn't emphasize, well, what Bible college did you go to? It does not emphasize, it's not said that he must be in a big shot in the denomination or approved of the hierarchy. It does not say that he must be a good speaker. Boys, are you listening to me? I think you ought to, be, to do your best to articulate and express verbally the Word of God the best that you can. But I remind you that Moses told God, I stutter. I don't speak good. And I'm telling you something. God takes that which is not in the eyes of the world and God will use that. And I want to encourage you because you may say, well, I don't feel like I could be a good speaker and I don't feel like I could do that. You're just the kind God can use if you realize your inability. Van, I don't know what it used to be right up here. Van had a little deal that said it's not your ability that God's interested in. It's your availability that God's interested in. God did not say that you need to be a great speaker or orator. He did not say that you needed a charismatic personality. None of these things are listed in the requirements for a bishop. But I tell you what the Bible does teach, that they were with Jesus, the disciples were with Jesus Christ for three years. And the secret is get with Jesus. That may or may not be Bible college for you. But I don't care how many Bible colleges you go to, if you never get with Jesus, you're never going to mount the hill of beans in the ministry. This will throw you a curve. The Apostle Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. And then he spent 14 years on the backside of Arabia in the desert before he entered the public ministry. Jesus didn't enter the public ministry until he was 30 years old. We better start thinking about these things in the Bible. They've got more implication than we think. You say, what does a man in the ministry need to do? First of all, he needs to be sure he's saved. There will be preachers... There are preachers that are preaching that are lost. The Bible said many false prophets are gone out into the world. 
I would say this to you. You better make sure you're called. Make your calling and election sure. If you're saved and you're called and you're sure, then I'll tell you what you better do. You better, be the, you better wear your eyes out reading that Bible. You read that Bible and you read that Bible and you read that Bible and you read that Bible till you, under, till you have a good concept of the structure, the whole framework of Scripture. You meditate on Scripture. You memorize Scripture. Be filled with the Spirit. And I will say this to you with all of my heart. There is no substitute. Even intellectual knowledge of the Bible is no substitute for having the unction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that cannot be taught and cannot be done to a man in any kind of an educational institution. Let me tell you where unction and anointing comes from. It comes when you get alone with God and you literally, with the hand of God, touches you and enables you to do. And whenever, let me tell you something, the difference between that is, if you have the anointing and you have the unction, nobody has to wonder whether you're called or not. But do not attempt or profess to have an anointing and an unction without diligent study. They go together. God will never give a feeling to that, to an unction to the person who is lazy in studying. They go together. And let me say further than this, put your soul into it. Put your heart into it. Give it everything you've got. And get a burden for people and for the work of the Lord. Uh, a vision is so critical. I thank God that in 1982, God gave me a vision. And I've literally lived to see God fulfill that vision that He gave me in the ministry. And um, there's a lot of things I could preach on. I have, a, I have a deal put together for young preachers, and someday I'll bring it. But I just want to encourage you tonight, if you're here, these are qualifications. Guys, let me say them to you. This is one of the reasons Satan wants to get you messed up immorally when you're young. If he can get you messed up to where you've given your heart to three different women before you ever meet your wife, or he can get your wife messed up where she's given her heart to six different boys before you marry her, and you don't have some convictions and so forth, and you wind up, you know what? Satan may be fighting you all, all down through the years because he knows God has a call on your life. He's trying to mess it up and ruin it so that you can never be what God would have had you to be. Further, let me say this. If our lives have gotten messed up and uh, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, there will never come a time when God can't use you for His glory and for His kingdom in some, some sweet and some wonderful way. So please don't sit there tonight saying, well, I messed my deal up. Don't say that. Say, God, what can I do with what I have left? Old Vance having her preached that He's the Lord of a, he's also the Lord of what's left of your life. If you've never read that little book, you ought to read it. God is the Lord of what's left. And I want to say humbly before the Lord in this congregation tonight, I, I haven't fulfilled all those qualifications. I haven't been everything I ought to be. And I have to say with the Apostle Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. That's all. So I encourage you tonight, God's called you to the ministry. Read those things. But don't let... Your failures. And don't look at yourself. Look at Christ. Because it's only in Christ that you can ever be and do what God wants you to do and to be. It's been a good night and a good day, hasn't it? Appreciate these men coming and singing and uh, being with us. Appreciate you coming to help Danny and Connie. And I want to encourage you young men in the Lord. God will not forget your service in His name to other people. Let's stand together tonight. Brother Spurgeon, it's good to have you with us tonight. Would you come up and dismiss our service tonight, please? If I could ask you to do that. I, uh, I appreciate this man. He has a barbershop in Mountain Grove, and he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you go in his barbershop, there will be things in there. There will be gospel tracts in there. And, uh, and he, he keeps a good atmosphere in that place. Brother Virgin. How many of you are glad you came to ha the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the word that's going forth tonight. We're thankful, Lord, for the ministry that 
We know where Brother Edge is has shown forth in this community and thankful for the souls that have been saved through his ministry. We pray, God, for each family that's here tonight. Bless them, we pray. Keep your hand of protection over each one of us as we travel, and may our hearts be stayed upon you and continually draw closer to thee. Make us better witnesses unto you through the rest of our life, we pray. And may you have your way in each of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.